Hey everyone, and happy Thanksgiving weekend to my American audience. For everyone else, I guess you could still eat a bird and be thankful for other things. Like, for example, the Linux and open source news. Because this week, we have some interesting updates to Cosmic, Pop OS's future desktop environment. But also some really cool things coming to Plasma 6, Gnome putting their 1 million euro fund to good use, and also the latest moves from Google to actually harm the consumer by trying to fight ads. Or you could also give thanks to this segue for our sponsor. Thanks to Tuxcare for sponsoring this video. Tuxcare is the solution to ensure your Linux fleet is kept up to date and secure with as little downtime as possible. They offer live patching of the Linux kernel and they also provide extended support for end-of-life distributions, like, for example, Debian 10. Debian 10 will be end-of-life in June 2024, which means that you will have to either move to a newer version of Debian to stay secure, or you will have to migrate to another distro if Debian 11 or 12 don't suit your needs. And if you need more time to plan that migration, you can have it! thanks to Tuxcare's extended lifecycle support for Debian 10. You will get patches for all high and critical vulnerabilities in Debian 10, plus updates to a lot of essential server packages, so you can stay safe and compliant while you decide what to use next. And all that is required is a simple script to migrate to Tuxcare's repos and get all these patches. So if you're interested and you need more time with Debian 10, Click the link in the description below and get started. So, we got some more news about Cosmic, System 76's desktop environment that will replace GNOME in Pop! OS. First, they've decided to open Windows in the incorrect way, so not fully centered, as the first window will be centered, but the other ones will be offset by a range of 48 by 48 pixels to leave the previous Windows header visible. I am joking, obviously, I do prefer all my windows to open centered on my display because I've got some kind of weird compulsion, but I know it's not the most efficient way. Now the team also added some new widgets for apps, to pick colors, to pick images, and to have separators and headers in drop-down lists. The text editor they're working on is progressing as well, with support for tabs, a directory tree to navigate projects, syntax highlighting, and Vim style editing and shortcuts. Cosmic will also support the Empress standard to control audio and video playback from the desktop itself, and they have fixed their workspaces implementation and improved the compositor quite a bit. It now supports custom themes, it now works with the NVIDIA drivers, it supports entering text in Chinese and Japanese through IME, and a lot more. And it also looks like they're also thinking of implementing HDR using the same work that has been done in KDE, to which apparently they contributed. So very good progress here, and it's also interesting to see that they're actually working on their own set of basic apps, like a text editor. I would be very surprised if in the future they didn't cover all the essentials, like a file manager, maybe a media, music player, video player, stuff like that. I imagine it's sort of like elementary OS, where there's the desktop and the essential suite of apps, and then you can install anything else that you want. Now, in other desktop environment news, we have some news about Plasma 6 and GNOME. So, on the KDE side, it looks like all the planned features for Plasma 6 are done now. And so the team is in full polishing mode, and they're fixing bugs left and right, since people are now testing the alpha and reporting issues. In terms of other changes, they managed to fix two of the three Wayland showstoppers. The first one being asking the users to save their changes in various files before restarting the computer, and the other being enabling bounce keys on Wayland. The third showstopper is sticky keys, and it's currently being worked on. There were also some more minor improvements, like being more reactive in displaying a change in your user picture, or new files being created on the desktop. They will also display more clearly which widgets are no longer compatible, since the update will require widgets to be ported to Plasma 6 specifically. They will let you reboot without applying updates, and they will also reorganize stuff in the various applets of the notification tray by separating brightness into the same applet as nightlight and out of the battery applet. They also fixed 221 bugs in a single week, which is absolutely nuts. 
So everything seems to be moving according to plan and it all looks really really great especially since they did manage to slot in some UI and UX improvements along the way. As per GNOME they have shared some progress on the various areas they've been working on thanks to the recent 1 million euro grant they got. This includes encrypting the user home directory by implementing systemd homed which is now supported. Or they also added a new USB portal to handle USB devices and they're improving existing ones meaning you can now drag and drop files to and from certain sandboxed applications. Other areas of improvement include supporting CSS variables in GTK, some profiling work for GNOME Shell and Mutter that will result in improved performance, better notifications with per app grouping or improving the GNOME online accounts to support CalDAV and CardsDAV and using OAuth2 to log in with your default browser instead of a web view. Finally, accessibility is being improved and there are hardware related improvements coming like hardware accelerated screencasts. In terms of apps, two new apps joined the GNOME circle, Switcheroo which is an image converter and Decibels which is an audio player. Gyrants, the Plex client was updated to support more LibidVita widgets and Fractal, the Matrix client got a giant update. It's a full rewrite of the app using LibidVita, the Matrix, Rust, SDK and more. And it adds end-to-end -end encryption, it lets you send your current location as a message, you can now reply to specific messages, you can react to them with emojis, you can edit your messages, you can see who read them and it also supports multiple accounts. It is really cool to see the wave of stuff GNOME gets to work on thanks to that huge donation and it's also going to benefit other projects because improvements to accessibility, GTK and portals will definitely have an effect on other desktops which is nice. Now there was some concern that YouTube was implementing an extra 5 second delay specifically for Firefox users before playing a video and Chrome users were not seeing that delay. But it apparently is not meant to punish Firefox users, it's to punish users of ad blockers in the recent series of moves from YouTube to combat this type of extension. This translates in the page staying blank for a while and Google definitely isn't getting the benefit of the doubt on this one as things are pretty confusing. Just changing the user agent in Firefox to Chrome seems to solve the issue. Mozilla says that they don't think it's a Firefox specific issue but it still feels pretty weird that only Firefox users can reproduce this behavior. It seems like it might be because YouTube doesn't block in-house trackers that do exist in Chrome but it does so with Firefox's trackers. To compound that, this delay isn't like a pop-up or a timer that the user can see. It's just an artificial delay. So it's not like any random user would know why this is happening or could take any action to solve the problem. It is all very weird and anti-consumer behavior and I think it's counterproductive. Like if you really want people to subscribe to premium or to disable their ad blocker, they should probably lean onto the blocking ads will harm this video's creator angle instead of just trying to make the experience worse for people. And in the same vein, Google apparently will be moving forward with their plans to deprecate browser extensions using the Manifest V2 extension, which will undeniably harm tracker blockers and of course ad blockers as well. While Google has revised the number of rules they will let extensions apply, the limit they implemented is still not enough for any decent ad blocker, which means that starting in June 2024, Chrome will be a terrible browser for not only blocking ads but also for privacy in general. For example, uBlock Origin needs about 300,000 rules to block ads from various sources, where the new Manifest v3 API only allows for 30,000. Fortunately, other browsers, whether Chromium based or not, will let extensions work as intended and will not enforce this new API, which in turn is sure to damage the market share of Chrome at least among tech savvy people. So while this is a sucky move for Chrome users, it might be a good thing for the web in general as more and more people will learn that they can actually have a better experience on other browsers and they will leave Chrome. At least some of them might. If you want to learn more about Manifest V3 and why it's a big problem for extensions, I have a dedicated video. I left a link in the description of this one. 
Now this week we also have a nice little reminder that while Linux isn't the most popular OS for PCs, it definitely isn't because it is lacking in performance. AMD recently released their brand new Threadripper CPUs based on the Zen 4 architecture. And these processors deliver much, much better performance on Linux than on Windows 11, apparently. Pharonix benchmarked a bunch of use cases with the Linux kernel 6.5, so not even the very latest with the new scheduler. And Linux, namely Ubuntu 23.10, was about 20% faster than Windows 11 Pro. Whether it was using Blender, encoding video, or just running CPU-bound benchmarks, Linux trounced Windows at every turn. And it's not even a matter of driver support, as one could argue that Windows drivers might not have been updated yet, because the tests were using the kernel 6.5 on Linux, which also doesn't necessarily have the very latest driver support for this CPU. So it's a true apples to apples comparison, and it really shows Linux can outperform Windows for some serious workloads and real-world use cases. Just a bit of feel-good confirmation bias for us Linux users. We might not be the most popular OS on the desktop, but at least we're blazing fast. Now, the open-source Vulkan drivers for NVIDIA GPUs are making good progress, and they're now fully conformant with Vulkan 1.0. This means that it passes the entire test suite and it can now claim it officially supports the Vulkan API. And in terms of how it works, it means that the driver should now just work, bar some app-specific bugs and issues. There's of course some more work to be done to support up to Vulkan 1.3 and also to support older GPUs with this driver. And the new compiler they recently merged also needs some extra work but it's good to at least have a fully functional Vulkan driver that supports every necessary extension. I am willing to bet that 2024 is the year where we have a finally turnkey open source solution for all NVIDIA GPUs, well, all modern NVIDIA GPUs, at least that's a lot of conditions. But yeah, the performance might not be as good as proprietary drivers, but at least out of the box we'll have a driver that is capable of doing more than just turn your display on. And let's finish this with the gaming news. First, it looks like Valve is adding some information on Steam to let you find games that support various controllers, including Xbox and PlayStation controllers. Individual pages for games also now show the exact controllers they support, and you now have per controller type filters. VKD3D Proton also got an update this week. This thing is what lets you run DirectX 12 games on Linux by translating them in Vulkan. And this new version brings DirectX ray tracing by default. You don't need a launch argument anymore. If the game uses ray tracing, it will work. DirectX Ultimate is also supported on RDNA 2 and Turing Graphics or newer. And this thing is a feature set that includes ray tracing, variable rate shading, mesh shading, or sampler feedback. There were also a bunch of bug fixes and performance improvements. It's really nice to see Linux bridging the gap for gaming because we already can play the vast majority of Steam games, but we can also now play them in very good conditions, which is awesome. And Wine 8.21 was released this week as well, with the recent Wayland patches to enable high DPI support and Vulkan support. Wine 8.21 also brings initial support for ARM 64 EC, which is a new application binary interface for Windows 11 apps for ARM CPUs. Wine gets the first pieces needed to support these binaries, and while virtually no one uses Windows 11 on ARM, it might change in the future as hardware and software matures, so it is good to have support planned for that. There were also 29 bugs fixed for games like Port Royale 2, Age of Empires 2 Definitive Edition, or Death Stranding. And there were also fixes on the Wayland driver and for Microsoft Office 2021, and a lot more. And this should be the last 8.x version of Wine before having the stable Wine 9.0 release on which Proton should be rebased. It means a lot of these bug fixes and performance improvements will make their way to Proton and make the experience better for every Linux gamer. Just like our sponsor can make the experience better for every Linux user. Tuxedo makes laptops and desktops that ship with Linux out of the box. All the components inside are picked 
because they are compatible with Linux. And if Tuxedo encountered a few quirks or bugs here and there, they submit patches upstream to fix them for everyone. They have a big range of devices that you can just slap your own Linux distro on it, or you can pick from a selection of very popular distros that Tuxedo can pre-install. All the devices are very customizable. You can pick the components, you can change the keyboard layout on laptops, you can have your own logo engraved on the lid, and they should suit every price point and every need, whatever kind of computer you want. All the laptops can also be opened, repaired, and upgraded, which is a nice plus. So if you need a new computer, you want to run Linux on it, and you also want to support Linux's development, click the link in the description below and get yourself a device from Tuxedo. They're really, really good. So thanks everyone for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't hesitate to like, to subscribe, to turn on notifications, to write a comment. And if you didn't, there's always that thumbs down button and the comment section to tell me exactly why. And if you really enjoyed the channel and you want to support it, there are plenty of links in the description of the video as well to do just that. So thanks for watching and I guess you'll see me in the next one. Bye.